Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Major changes are now taking place in the Soviet Union. The Baltic peoples of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania will be free to determine their own future. Mingling with the rush hour traffic, Red Army armored personnel carriers on the streets of Moscow this morning. Momentous events today. The course of history is changed. Mikhail Gorbachev resigns. The Soviet Union collapsed 30 years ago, in part because its government-run economy was incapable of producing blue jeans, cigarettes, and automobiles that its citizens wanted. What it was great at was producing champion chess players. From the end of World War II until the evil empire dissolved in 1991, all but one world champion, the American Bobby Fischer, represented the USSR. None was better than Garry Kasparov, who became the world champion in 1985 at the record young age of 22. Widely considered the greatest chess player in modern history, he held that title for 15 years. As a chess prodigy, he traveled abroad for competitions, and he describes youthful trips to France and Germany as nothing short of revelatory. The casual abundance of what used to be called the free world just felt different, he says. Beyond the Iron Curtain, he encountered the anti-communist works of George Orwell and was able to read exiled dissident Alexander Solzhenitsyn's suppressed indictments of totalitarianism. As the 80s progressed, he publicly questioned the Soviet system. In 1990, he joined the Democratic Party of Russia and became increasingly outspoken in favor of human rights, representative democracy, and limited government. In post-Soviet Russia, he used his celebrity and influence to spearhead attempts to build civil society and conduct fair elections, emerging as a leading critic of Russian leader Vladimir Putin. By the early 2010s, he had been arrested for participating in unauthorized anti-government demonstrations and was widely believed to be the author of a popular petition demanding Putin's resignation. As chairman of the Human Rights Foundation, Kasparov continues to lobby for freedom in the former Soviet Union and beyond. In September, Reason spoke with the chess grandmaster in New York about what it was like to be the beneficiary of a catastrophically failed Soviet system and what lessons the world, especially American democratic socialists, should remember three decades after its collapse. Gary Kasparov, thanks for talking to Reason. Can you describe where you were when you first realized that the Soviet Union was finished for good? Believe it or not, but I would not recall my whereabouts on December 25th. And the probably reason that I, uh, I was not surprised. I knew that the Soviet Union was dead long before they lowered the flag, Soviet flag, and just raised the Russian flag. Uh, somehow I felt, even in the late 80s, that the end was near. I remember speaking in Germany, I think in 1987, for a group of German uh, businessmen. It's just chess presentation. Uh, I was working uh, on a computer project and uh, and they asked me about Gorbachev, Perestroika, and, and about the future, whether it will last. And I stunned them saying, absolutely, because I believe the Soviet Union was moving just in one direction. The system just couldn't sustain the, uh, the pressure of time, uh, new technologies. So it's the, like fax machines. So this, I knew that the whole concept of Iron Curtain would no longer hold the, the pressure. And I knew also from inside that there was a growing demand to open up. And I told them, look, I think things will change soon. And uh, in a few years, we'll see the, uh, the collapse of Berlin Wall. That was the end of the conversation because they looked at me, OK, yeah. well, uh, what, what you can know? you expect? Yeah. You know, this is, this is. <laughs> and, and I had a few moments like that in the next couple of years because I always believed you know, that the things would go faster than it, they did. And after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, I was the one who said that reunification of Germany would be, uh, would be uh, uh, in, uh, um, in the agenda very soon. While people said, oh, no, it's, it's, it's impossible because of the historical memories and uh, other European nations might be against it. But again, it all happened because the time was right for the Soviet Union to be gone. And also, I knew from inside, you know, of, of the Soviet Union, uh, because I had a lot of connections. I was a world champion. 
and being the chess world champion in the Soviet Union, yeah, it just would give you not just privileges, but it's a lot of authority. And I could speak uh, uh, um, speak um, uh, out and just, uh, uh, well, my voice was heard. And, um, and I, though I was young, I was just, uh, I became world champion at age 22 in 1985. And the, in just in 1989, the collapse of Berlin Wall, I was just 26. And I was 28 when the Soviet Union collapsed. But I, I always play chess, you know, relying on my intuition. And my intuition kept telling me it's over, it's over. And uh, the August coup, you know, for me, again, it just was the, the last grasp of the, of the old system. And I was on, on, on Larry King because I, I uh, had my vacation training session in Los Angeles with my, with my mother and, and, and a couple of my you know, assistants. And when it's happened, you know, the, the American political pundits, they, and of course the American government and European governments, they were all terrified. Oh, that's, that's the end of Gorbachev, Perestroika. And I don't want them to go into details because I believe Gorbachev was part of this, of this plan. But when I was uh, called by Larry King wife and invited, and uh, I was there with a local professor from, I think from Stanford University and Jim Kirkpatrick. Mm -hmm. And the question was about the future. And uh, they first turned to me, asking, so what's, what's next? I said, that's, it's, it's, it's act of desperation, 48 hours. And of course, they lost any interest. Right. And I remember Jim Kirkpatrick saying, yes, maybe not 48 months, but definitely 48 weeks. So they talked about, you know, that's just these things that I knew, again, instinctively, that were just, you know, that came from the past. They couldn't evaluate correctly the position on the board. This, um, you know, is obviously a very big question, but did the Soviet Union, did it collapse from within or without or how you mentioned technologies coming that were going to tear it apart? How, how does that work? It's a combination of factors. So you cannot, you know, simply say it's the pressure from within right. or pressure from outside. It's a combination, but the pressure from outside was a very important factor. Uh, and uh, hard to believe now that the Reagan's fantasy about uh, Star Wars played a significant role uh, in, in uh, um, Soviet Politburo deciding to open up. Uh, if we remember, you know, just as what Gorbachev said when he was uh, uh, elected um, in um, March 1985, it was not about perestroika. It was not about glasnost. All these, these, these terms, uh, like, you know, opening up of so glasnost, it, they, they would appear late 86 or 87. When he talked about perestroika, it was about military-industrial complex. It was all about uh, uh, um, uh, matching American uh, um, technological proneness. And uh, the idea of the Star Wars uh, was, you know, was like a thorn in, in, in the minds of, of members of Polidoro. And that's why Gorbachev desperately tried to convince Reagan to drop it. Mm -hmm. And the real beginning of, this, of the democratization could be marked uh, uh, clearly uh, by the end of 1986 after Gorbachev's failure in Reykjavik to convince mm -hmm. Reagan to drop the Star Wars. Right. Uh, and then Gorbachev, after coming back, recognized that they would need to do something, you know, just to, to, uh, to open up the, the energy of Soviet society and, mm -hmm. and, and do something to, to make USSR more competitive. And he called Sakharov who was in uh, the city of Gorky in exile and brought him back to Moscow. That's the end of the 1986. And the beginning of 1987, we already saw the changes in Politburo, the rise of Alexander Yakovlev, uh, the, the man who was real ideologue behind, behind this democ democratization. Um, and again, I, am, I have no doubt that that's, you know, that's was the combination of these factors, pressure from outside, but also the, uh, the inability of the Soviet system to compete against new technologies. It's just, it's they, they, they required, you know, more engagement of, of talent and then simply so working bring, the old way didn't, didn't help. So they're bringing in Sakharov, the, the most famous of their scientists, but calling so, but him in from exile. Yeah, but exactly. But it's not, not Sakharov was, was one of the most prominent scientists, right. the father of, of H-bomb in the right. Soviet Union. 
Uh, three times, by the way, the hero of the of of it's not Soviet Union, but it's it's a like a socialist labor. So that's it's one of the most decorated men in the country who uh, raised his voice in the late sixties mm -hmm. against against uh, Soviet tyrannical regime did, and wanted so to dem democratize. Why did they? You know, it's kind of interesting though because why did Gorbachev decide to open up or or, or the Politburo they instead of closing down even more? Yeah, but because again they they needed to be competitive. So the system didn't function well. So mm -hmm. this is they, and they didn't have the um, the the other other alternatives. When people say, "Oh, there was a Chinese alternative," I don't think you know it's it's these the the, the, the this suggestion would um, stand you know the rigorous analysis. Mm -hmm. China had massive rural population. It's like you know reservoir. They could bring people in. They could also rely on these people to form the army, police. Right. They could use it against students in Tiananmen Square. Russia, Soviet Union, had especially the, 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 the European part, it was, it, it was urbanized. So this is the, and the, the, they, they need to find a way to satisfy this population. And again, it's just, this is, it was more and more difficult to keep people misinformed about what's happening in, right. in, in other parts yeah, of the did world. Did you, you know, one of uh, Tiananmen Square and the, the Berlin Wall in 1989 in the spring and the fall, um, were those events that were widely understood or, or and, and seen in the Soviet Union? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. At, the, at that time, the Soviet Union was, you know, quite, I wouldn't say free, mm -hmm. but it had a lot of press that could, you know, could go after sacred cows of the communist regime. And of course, we followed the news. And the collapse of the Berlin Wall was, uh, you know, was a really big event because it's, it's symbolic. But symbolism is a very important part of any dictatorship. It's uh, and and uh, um, and uh, it's you know it's it sends signal all over the place that it's that's it. So it's the and um, I I can just have two couple of anecdotes. Yeah. You know that's the, just about my views are, are, and my engagement with the situation. So one is the story. I first met Miller Schwarman in 1988. So it was organized by a Czech grandmaster, you know, who wanted in, 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 us to be introduced to each other. And we had dinner in Paris. And uh, Milos was very skeptical about perestroika and about everything that is happening in the Soviet Union. Uh, and I was very optimistic. And, and he kept asking me, so Gary, tell me how, how you think it could happen, you know? So I saw it. We saw 20 years ago, it was Prague. And before uh, 68, well, before it was Hungary, it n n didn't work. Yeah. I said, Miller, I didn't know, but I can tell you, one day you open your window and you find out they've gone. Hmm. And in it's and after after the collapse of the of the uh, Czechoslovakian communist regime. So one day just in the morning, I, I don't recall where I was, you know, in the world, but I got a telephone call and so, 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 so says Miller, you know, Gary, you were right. I opened the window and they've gone. <laughs> yeah. And and then at the very end of the night in 89, just uh, um, uh, we had uh, the Congress of Soviet chess players actually was another sign of democratization, just you know, going away from the uh, Soviet sports ministry. And in the middle of, of this of the of this meeting, so we got the news from Romania about the revolution. And I stopped the meeting, saying, "Now I have to congratulate our our you know our fellow fellow no, Romanians. You know, that's they now they they toppled the last communist dictatorship, and it was big ovation." So. It's about you know about the mood. Mm -hmm. People didn't want to go with with old regime. It just it's it's the the gap between expectations and uh, or public expectations and ability of the regime to to serve them. That was was too great to 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 close. You mentioned Romania, which was essentially the only violent revolution of yeah. a of a former um, kind of Warsaw Pact or or Soviet satellite or communist country in Europe. Why do you think the transition was as peaceful. Uh, you know, it, it's not like uh, there was a lot of damage done, but why was Romania the only kind of really violent overthrow? Uh, but it's not, it's, yeah, it's, there was a violence, but it was not like a civil war. It right. was very, very quickly um, uh, uh, um, uh, and it quickly ended uh, by decisive intervention of the army. And it's, it's desperate attempt of Ceausescu and his, uh, and, and his, some of his uh, secret police uh, uh, superior um, generals uh, who again, who couldn't read signs on the wall. So maybe he could have escaped, but he just, you know, he thought that he could just continue doing the same things. By the way, he was, I think he was the only, you know, lifetime dictator because others, you know, they, they, they still had, you know, it's, uh, there was some sort of uh, um, collaboration between different factions. Mm -hmm. So, but let's not forget, 
Eastern Europe was occupied. It was not just you know, the homegrown communism that won. It was the communism that was protected all the time by the Soviet bayonets. So it's the, it, it, and the moment Gorbachev recognized that he couldn't afford uh, supporting this regime, sustaining them by using military power for a simple reason, because you know if if you if your house is is is, is at fire, so you cannot you know send in you know, a fireman just you know, to to the, to the neighborhood, and Gorbachev knew that he would have problems in Ukraine. He had problems in in the south of the country, so he already saw the rise of of, of Russian nationalism. So um, the moment you know he, he made his his choice, I think again it's just it's a, it was a rational political choice to abandon abandon uh, the communist regimes in Eastern Europe, they were doomed. So let's talk about the system that produced you. The Soviet system you know, famously was bad at producing cars, couldn't produce blue jeans or cigarettes that people wanted to smoke. It did produce chess champions. And you, producing you in particular, you were the world's youngest chess champ at 22. Before we get to the Soviet thing, tell, tell me what that felt like to be 22 years old and to be the best goddamn chess player on the planet. Uh, that was hilarious moment. So, it was just, uh, because as you said, chess chess was a big thing in the Soviet Union, and uh, winning world title, becoming the world champion, that was like you know just uh, uh, entering the legend. Because it's the uh, I grew up as a kid, you know, reading these books. And for me, it was all like about just, you know, gods or at least high priests, you know, that's just serving the god, the goddess of chess. And and uh, the fact is that I could, you know, enter this pantheon, you know, it was just hard to explain. But I also recognized, you know, after becoming the world champion that I could actually do something to to help my country because I I had my voice uh, just to, uh, to, 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 to uh, raise because somehow it's, it's, it's a paradox. The Soviet system always uh, nurtured world champions. So it's, it's, they were, it's, the system was proud of it because chess had a huge state support in the Soviet Union because it was viewed as the very important ideological tool to prove intellectual superiority of communist regime over decadent West. So it's, uh, it's very important for Soviet regime to demonstrate that intellectually you know, it's, it's, it's way ahead of the rest of, of, of uh, the world because they knew that they couldn't compete in doing cars or, uh, or jeans or producing, you know, quality food. Um, that's why when Bobby Fischer uh, crushed all Soviet players and became world champion, that was a moment of panic. And uh, that's how Anatoly Karpov, my, my opponent, my nemesis, uh, the man I played five world championship matches, um, with, uh, he was raised, he, had, he was a great talent, but he received phenomenal support from the highest echelons of power because the, the Soviet Union needed this title back. And, uh, um, on and then the, he beat Korchnoi, right? Who was yeah, a he, defector. He, he beat Korchnoi well. in 78 because right. he played two matches with Victor Korchnoi who right. defected, which boosted Karp of standing as the, as the hero of the system. So the, the soldier of the, of the Communist Party. Um, and he was congratulated by, by Brezhnev himself. So, and uh, that turned my match against Karpov as a challenge against the system. And that's also interesting because a lot of people, famous people who rooted for me, they saw the, um, the change on the Chess Olympus in 1985. The Gary Kasparov, a half Armenian, half Jewish boy from Baku, beating Russian champion as a sign that changes, change was possible. It's, again, it's very difficult to even just to, to grasp this moment. And, but I remember some of them were crying. So this is famous art, uh, artists, you know, this is people, you know, this is uh, who just, you know, were well known in the country. And I had a lot of friends. I was very young, but they just, they, they, they treated me as, as one, of, one of their own. And they said, wow, it's possible. So, and I think millions of my fellow citizens shared the same, the same feelings. If Karpov could be, could be toppled, by this, by this young kid from Baku, maybe the whole system is no longer invincible. So you're kind of like the Bobby Fischer of the Soviet system, a, a person Some, coming yes, but, out but of exactly. nowhere. But, it's, but it's, it's, I was product you know, of the system right. itself, and, uh, and it, it had much bigger shock. And also, again, 1985. Yeah. So it's, we always need luck 
even if you're the best, you know, in your field, you have great talent, but, you know, things could, could be changed if, you know, Gorbachev, Perestroika, Gorbachev, a rise to power could be postponed, uh, could be somehow delayed. Uh, there was a good chance that I would be disqualified in, in August 1985 because after our first match was closed and I, I, I spoke against this decision, I had an interview with Der Spiegel magazine that was translated in, in, in many languages in May 1985. And uh, some of the corporate supporters, they pushed you know, my disqualification as, as a rebel who was threatening the, the uh, very foundation of Soviet regime, speaking against decisions made by authorities. And uh, if not for Gorbachev's um, um, uh, control of Politburo in, in summer '95 and Alexander Yakovlev's intervention, uh, so um, who became the head of the ideological department, so it's in, in the Communist Central Committee of the Communist Party, I might be well disqualified in August 1985. So I was lucky, but again, this you know, it's, it's like all elements got together. Um, and then this is that's the as I mentioned uh, meetings you know Gorbachev and Reagan so things you know were working in my favor and I thought wow maybe again you know, I have to raise my voice this it's, I, I, I never made any calculations all I this the thought I had so many people spoke against regime because I knew about the, the great dissidents like Sakharov and others and many of them failed uh, they couldn't actually achieve any results because they were just you know facing the wall so they I had a chance to speak for all of them, and it's like a moral duty. What uh, did you have a strong sense when uh, Reagan uh, famously uh, called the Soviet Union an evil empire? Do you remember that? And did that were you kind of like, yeah, he's onto something, or was that a calumny against your uh, your country? I remember that when Reagan was elected in 1980, uh, that was. Mm, um, it, it sends Soviet propaganda in disarray because they they have been panicking. It's just you know the Reagan was looked like just you know just the president who would even start a war. So and and the Soviet propaganda was filled with anti-Americanism and uh, um, and uh, of course all these campaigns to um, stop American um, middle-range missiles yeah. to to appear in Europe and that's all the peace movement and also you have Maggie Thatcher there and and and, and the Falkland War. So. It's you know, in 1982-1983, so that when Brezhnev died and Dropov took over, so they, and and the the Soviets shut uh, uh, shut down the the South Korean um, Boeing, right. killing yeah. 269, right. uh, including a, a congressman who was a member of the John Birch Society. Yeah. So it's yeah. like the, no, but it's, yeah. it's, it's, it, it's it was something that you know just you know that's it's uh, we all sensed that it was a great danger and um the, I mean the the. the Soviet propaganda did not push the message. So this is, it was briefly mentioned, but they did not want Soviet people to actually start chewing on it. So, so that's why, yes, Breger was bad. He said something, but it was not, you know, the like front page news. So they, they tried to downplay it. So it was the, I think it was 1983 when he said it, and, and, um, and Reagan's landslide victory in 1984, I think just was another, you know, just another reminder that they had to deal with Reagan and with the Republican administration, and the Star Wars were already there. So it's the, you know, we don't know all the details about the fight, you know, um, behind closed doors, like Churchill described, you know, the bulldogs under the Kremlin's carpet. Uh, but it seems to me that, you know, the Gorbachev was on the rise because he was an Andropov's man. And 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 Andropov wanted him, you know. It's it's and, and the KGB actually supported Gorbachev because they knew they had to make some changes. They knew they had to compete with the with the free world in a very new environment. It's uh, I mean, let's not forget the Soviet Union um, was always you know technologically inferior. So the big push after World War II was very very much a result of the land lease. So, so much technology was was. Um, uh, delivered to the Soviet Union, and I think it's in this country few people r recognize that it's while Werner von Braun and some of the top scientists landed up in American occupation zone, and of course he played a key role in building American space program. Uh, the Soviets got actually their hands on the production line, so this is the the factories they were on the, in the Soviet Soviet side, and uh, that's why um, immediately when they recognized it, Korolev, who was the the the, 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 the like a top engineer, so as the designer of the space program, who was in, 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 in prison, he was released and was, you know, was assigned to analyze it. So Soviet got a lot from Germany. So 
even by the way, the Kalashnikov, this is, that's, the, that's a product of, of Hugo Schmeister Bureau that worked in the Soviet Union for many years. And Kalashnikov was, you know, like an uh, 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 apprentice there. So, so um, um, and, 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 and it's the, the, the resources uh, and ideas that have been accumulated uh, uh, after World War II, uh, they just, they, they were running out. Mm -hmm. So when you became a chess champion and you're, you know, you're 22, you are at the apex of Soviet society. I mean, you, you are a, a, a national hero. Yes. The messages that you wanted to send, and, and how did you do that? Because obviously, we, you know, we see even today when somebody like a LeBron James or a Michael Jordan or something, if they say something political, um, you know, in, in America, people get in trouble, uh, or, you know, they get in trouble. What were the messages you were trying to send and how did you have to do that? within the context of a Soviet Union. Yeah, okay, and like LeBron, LeBron James, I'm not on the peril of any dictatorship, so I... Uh, <laughs> unlike, I, uh, unlike, yes, unlike, yeah, yes. yeah. I, um, no, I, I, again, just, you know, I was 22, mm -hmm. then 23 and 86, so I was very busy playing matches with Karpov, but I didn't have any political agenda. You know, it was too early to become a dissident. I knew that the system was, was doomed. It had to change. How? Um, I, 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 not the slightest idea how. I just knew it's, 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 it, everything was going. It's, it was like one-way street. Um, I became more um, acute with my political statements in 88, 89, when I just joined the nascent pro-democracy movement in the Soviet Union. And in late 88, I met, I met Andrei Sakharov, actually in Paris, his, his first trip abroad. First trip because he, you know, he was, you know, uh, he always lived in secrecy and then was in exile. So it's the, and and um, uh, we met there, and I uh, was truly impressed by by his, you know, clear cut ideas about the future, and um, I um, I thought that it was time for me just to play, you know, just a more aggressive role as the role model, because I knew I was somehow protected by my title, uh, and I could speak, you know. Freely, just I could afford more than ordinary citizens, even prominent citizens. Uh, I could travel around the world. I was financially independent already. So it's, it's I, I, I thought that if I remain silent, that would be a bad message to millions of my uh, fellow citizens. If I could speak out, and if I could just, you know, not even with a very clear and articulate message, but something, you know, just about the future, about us, you know, getting involved, that would send the sort of right message to, 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 to these people and could encourage them, not maybe all of them, but many, to join the pro-democracy movement, to actually, to recognize that, wow, our world champion, chess world champion, is speaking against um, power abuse of the system, is talking about changes, it's talking about democracy, it's elections. Maybe we should also join. So I, I knew that, you know, that's, 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 that was important contribution. It, again, it sounds very chaotic because I had no plan. So, but I always felt that uh, my title and my, the uniqueness of my position as the chess world champion in the Soviet Union um, uh, almost um, uh, uh, forced me into, into this kind of confrontation with the regime. You talked in the past about how when you, you got to travel um, as a young person, and I uh, read or saw somewhere where you were talking about starting to have doubts when you were traveling abroad at uh, age 13. Can you talk about, like, you know, what was it like? Was your day-to-day -day existence in the Soviet Union, was, was it kind of pleasant? And then you go abroad and you, I mean, you sound like the Buddha, you know, who leaves the family compound and starts to see poverty and old age and disease and things like that. How did, how did you start to realize the, the world you were living in was not in the Soviet Union or in Azerbaijan was not the only thing that was possible? Yeah, if you want parallels with Buddha, it's exactly reversed. Because I saw, I saw the rich. I saw, I saw, I saw the other side of the right. world. Yeah. So uh, the world, yeah. the, 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 the world, you know, uh, uh, world of copious and abundance. So it's the um, country to the Soviet Union, the, the world of deficit. Um, I, um, no, I grew up in a family, a, a family where I had access to, to books and information that were not you know, available in public libraries. So my, my father died when I was seven, but uh, his uh, younger brother, my uncle, uh, you know, just brought me into this, in these circles of Jewish intelligentsia. 
uh, in Baku, and um, and I I had my doubts, and I remember having uh, debates with my grandfather, my mother's father, who was the member of Communist Party since 1931, who also was a bit concerned about the way things were working in in the 70s because it's he spent his life, you know, just working for the Communist Party and for 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 the state, and he wasn't sure that you know his um, his life was spent. Well, because it was not what he expected. It's not. It's not what what he, what he believed when he just uh, started his life journey. Um, but we still had a lot of debates, and we had uh, um, in in our small apartment, you know, in the dining room, we had a big uh, a political map of the world, and we talked about it. So this is just look at the map, and he was also very political, just you know, having a uh, um, few magazines where we can re read about, of course, Soviet magazines about uh, uh, foreign politics, and uh, um, and so between these two worlds, so this is my uncle and the Jewish professors and my grandfather. So I, you know, it's it was you know like boiling this these ideas were just boiling in my head and and also I you know I, I I had good analytical skills I could look around so also Soviet Union had many movies already it's few Americans but mostly Italian French so we knew about the other side of the world also the Voice of America Radio Liberty so BBC Deutsche Welle um, I knew about the existence of the other uh, 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 other world but when I could travel at age 13 and return, wow, it's, it sounds, you know, so trivial. Okay, big deal, you travel to France. My, 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 my six-year-old son now already traveled to so many countries. He was in France, he was in Estonia, he was in Croatia. So it was, it's, it's, he, he, he can tell about these this places. That's the, and my 15-year-old daughter now just, you know, she already visited you know, half of Europe. So. Uh, uh, not mentioning that she was both she was born in America, of course. Yeah, I think in my neighborhood in Baku, and Baku was the fourth largest uh, city in the Soviet Union, so after Moscow, Leningrad, and Kiev, um, over a mil million million inhabitants. Um, when I say neighborhood, it's just you know it's 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 a very large part of the city. I think I was the only one who visited the capitalist country. Right. <laughs> it's and I became not just it's just a hero, but someone. So unique. Forget chess. He went to France and he came back because to be sent to France, to be sent to the capitalist country. I mean, that's uh, you had to go through so many layers of of um, uh, due diligence. You know, uh, they had to vet you so that that you were allowed to to go there and you would come back. And of course, my mother couldn't travel with me because that was a rule. It's like a you know, the hostage rule. Mm -hmm. So the the family must stay there just to make sure that the talent. Is by accident, you know, by spontaneous uh, emotional decision, uh, is not is not uh, um, asking for political asylum. So, um, and uh, um, um, and I came back, and then I had another trip in, in 1977 to France because I was the Soviet. Do you agent. remember what was it about France? Uh, you know that it, it was not about France. It's just it was it. It's I could immediately see the quality of life. It's so difficult. Uh, different. So yes, I could see that that's that's the the way the, the way people, you know, it was it was different and it was more natural. You know, that's you know that's that's that this this world you know is built you know uh, 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 it's on, on a very different foundation. But it felt right, and all even the minor details. So that's you know from the airport to other to other places. It's it just you know it's it's so it's so different. Even you know I just remember in 1980. I was 17. I was already one of the top players. So just it's the and I went to the uh, we flew to Germany. Um, I had to play um, uh, under 20 World Championship uh, um, with one of the one of the coaches, not my coach, one of just the Soviet chess officials. And I just recently discovered, you know, in my mother's archive, my diary. Just you know, just. Uh, I was already 17, I already had, you know, quite an experience traveling, and still I was quite shocked. So this is, it, 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 it's, it, it's an effect of this, you know, of the world of, you know, of this abundance. So this is on Soviet people, even with critical minds, it's, you know, it's very hard to, hard to describe. And, um, and of course, making these projections, I inevitably came to the conclusion that uh, uh, the regime, that was so much behind the uh, the free world, 
so it would um, would face um, challenges that it couldn't cope with. You have talked a lot about how w in, in the Soviet Union that you grew up in, there was a kind of ongoing myth of good Lenin, bad Stalin. How did that kind of filter into your thought, particularly as you were getting older and towards the end, what, what became the end of the Soviet empire? Yeah, it's very important, you know, just to, 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 uh, to um, analyze this, this, this certain stages of Soviet mythology. Uh, because every dictatorship needs mythology. It's like a religion. I, uh, ideology has to be built on, on cults. Um, it's not just, you know, invention of the, uh, of the um, Soviet, Soviet communists. So we go back, you know, to, to early, early days in every country, you know, you had propaganda machine, even though primitive uh, um, during revolutionary time that, that tried to, to um, to build these new cults and to convince people, you know, of certain things that uh, that um, you know, were contrary to their previous beliefs. Um, Soviet Union started with Lenin and uh, Lenin's cult. Stalin used it, and then, you know, it's 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 the um, at, after Stalin's death, they the the Communist Party bosses tried to. To separate, so again they were very cautious. They they, they revealed Stalin's role in, in big terror, but they always tried to separate to make sure that you know there were excesses, mm -hmm. just to keep the system you know from 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 criticism. Uh, there were also attempts to 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 uh, rehabilitate Stalin. So this is in uh, late Brezhnev's years. So there was just more about Stalin's role in the World War II. Um, but then you know during Gorbachev's years, that's Stalin became the number one target. So that's it's, 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 and they desperately tried to keep Lenin out of that, but it was impossible because more and more people looked, wait a second, that's the, they, the thing's connected. Um, and uh, the irony is today in Putin's Russia, roles reversed. Putin's regime, they, they keep Lenin in the mausoleum, they don't care, but it's not Lenin, it's Stalin. Stalin is a big hero. Lenin is just, it's ideology. Stalin is, is a pure cult of power. So that's why in today's Russia, in Putin's Russia, Putin's dictatorship looks at Stalin, Ivan the Terrible. So this is those, you know, uh, figures of Russian and Soviet history as, so as, the, as the role models. Because Stalin at the end of the day, you know, just didn't care very much about ideology. So yes, he was a communist leader, but it's power. It's power, it's terror, it's spreading the influence, building empire, ex expanding it. And uh, that's, that resonates very much with, with modern Russian dictatorship. When you were in the Soviet Union, um, did you think of yourself, uh, you're part Jewish, you're part Armenian, but you were growing up in Azure, Azerbaijan, uh, but you were part of the Soviet system, but you often talk about yourself as Russian because the culture you grew up in. How, how did you come to a kind of, what was your sense of personal identity in, in the Soviet Union? Was and, and I guess, was anybody a Soviet or were they always some subgroup within the Soviet Union? L lines, lines were very blurry, yeah. Um, as for me, I grew up in a family that spoke Russian. That's the, that's the only language that was spoken in, in, in the family. Uh, my mother already spoke little Armenian. My grandparents did, but they came from Nagorno-Karabakh. But my mother and her sisters, they had very, very limited knowledge because they visited uh, the ancestral lands, you know, during their summer vacations when they were in school. Um, so I grew up in a city uh, that was, you know, a melting pot. It's like an imperial city. Unlike capitals of neighboring Transcaucasian republics, Yerevan, capital of Armenia, or Tbilisi, capital of Georgia, a uh, republic of Georgia, um, Baku was multinational, and Russian was the main language spoken there. Um, so that's why, you know, my, uh, from early days, my affiliation was clearly, you know, with Russian culture, with, you know, it's, it's like being a citizen of an empire. Uh, when people ask me, so, uh, you know, you left Azerbaijan, and I had to leave, you know, after Armenian pogroms uh, in 1990. So, you know, but you're born there, so now you live in another country. I said, no, I was born in a country where Moscow was the capital. And I, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, I stayed in the country where Moscow was the capital. Somehow, you know, you can just view people like me as the, 
as the French born in Algeria or the Brits born in, in Ceylon. So it's just, yeah, when things changed, so we just had to move to, to, to the metropolis because we belong there. I had strong, you know, spiritual affiliation with, with Armenia and with Israel, with, 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 but this is, again, yeah, it's, um, it still doesn't affect my identity. So as this is, I, I, I offered some help, not very much I could do, um, to Armenian refugees. So um, this, this selling one of my trophies and just uh, after, after uh, uh, these tragic events in Baku, um, and uh, I was always very supportive of uh, Armenian fight for, for independence of Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh. Of course, I was very supportive of Israel, the state of Israel. But it's probably more because, you know, it faced, you know, also the autocratic, tyrannical regimes. So that's this, el democracy was a very, very important element for me in, 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 uh, in these equations. So that's why I'm far more supportive of Israel than Armenia. So just right. because our Armenian regime deteriorated into, into also some form of autocracy. Uh, but all connections were, were, in, were with Russia. And that's why we moved, myself, my mother, uh, our sister. So we all moved to Moscow. So we, we belong there. And, it's, uh, and uh, calling ourselves Russians, I don't know how we, how we describe it. It's, in 2006, I even wrote an article called Russian Political Nation arguing that you know somehow we know we should view ourselves as as americans you, you, you could be american jew american italian you know you could uh, uh, be latino but you're still an american so this is this the it, it's not about roots it's about affiliation mm -hmm. so unfortunately in russia we still you know we we haven't reached this point and i think that's one of the one of the missed opportunities of the 1991 revolution that russia uh, had to accept the collapse of the empire but it's, it hasn't stopped being empire. So this is mentally so, this is the, the, the Russia hasn't changed itself into national state. When I say national state, it's state where people, you know, we're Russians. So this is no matter what, what could be, could be different, have different routes, Armenian, Tatars, uh, uh, Ukrainians, uh, whoever. And, and that's, you know, what Yeltsin failed or intentionally, you know, um, uh, delayed this process. And of course, Putin, you know, stopped it completely and just, you know, uh, pushed it in the opposite direction, backward. So um, Russia is just, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of a limbo because it's no longer an empire with, with some kind of phantom uh, 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 pains um, uh, uh, of, you know, just of, of this lost imperial, imperial grandeur. Um, uh, and, uh, and it's... it's and it's not in, it's never transferred into the in, in national state. That's why, you know, um, it's the, the Putin's regime, I will just, it's always tries to, to revive the, these uh, old spirits. Not with much success because it does, it, 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 that doesn't last. But still, you know, the, the last grasps of the Russian empire, they, they could be felt in the Republic of Georgia, in Ukraine, and, uh, God knows where else. What was it like to encounter the writings of uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, which I, I understand that you read those abroad yes. in Russian. What was that like when you're, you're traveling under the aegis of the Soviet system that produced you um, and, you know, that is paying your bills, but, and then you're reading this incredible critique of the system? Uh, yeah, I read, I read Solzhenitsyn uh, at age 18, so I already knew about the existence of these works. They, they have been, of course, banned in the Soviet Union, but we could hear parts of that on, on radio, on just on, on uh, BBC, on Voice of America, Radio Liberty, um, uh, so we could read some of this in some dubs. But the, 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 in full, I read it in 1981. And um, uh, Solzhenitsyn's... Uh, importance, you know, was to demonstrate that it was not about excess of the system. It was not about bad Stalin. It was about the system itself. It's a system built on terror, on denial of fundamental human rights, on ideology that, that, is, it, that does, doesn't stop at anything to promote, to promote its um, uh, most aggressive agenda. It was a very important uh, contribution to my education. So it's like a milestone. Um, and you keep keep adding things. It's not just Solzhenitsyn. There were it's a long list of authors not as known, um, but you know they helped to understand that the it's the system was beyond repair. Mm -hmm. 
So it's, it's an, any attempt to actually find, you know, this is the right moment in history. So yes, if we did that, you know, this is good. It helped to, to crystallize my views about the system. And that's why by the end of 80s, I knew that I was, I was anti-communist because it's the, this system, it, and I'm, these feelings are getting it only harder with time because <laughs> I'm seeing now the revival of it. And I'm, I'm terrified to see that many Americans have sympathies toward communism without even understanding what they're talking about. Can you ex ex uh, explore that a little bit more? When, what, what sympathies do Americans have with communism? It's communism and socialism. It's just things that America never experienced. But they became popular because it's a, people don't recall what happened 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And of course, you know, that's, that was ancient history. Right. So I spoke to many American audiences, you know, when I just, you know, had my uh, book Winter, Winter is Coming published. And, uh, you know, speaking to younger audiences, I, I think that many of them, you know, they, they couldn't, you know, tell apart, you know, the Cold War and the Trojan War. So it's this something that right. belonged to ancient history, and uh, unfortunately, this is the um, at the end of the Cold War, um, America lost its 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 way. So it's just it's it's, it's it was it, since 1991. I think geopolitically, if you look at just you know this big picture, it has been drifting, just this with no with no captain on the wheel, so sort of saying we go there. Since 1945. Uh, to 1991, it was it was a course. It you know it's the it's I think it's just it's also quite symbolic that it was charted by a Democratic administration under Harry S. Truman, and and it, it was finished by Reagan and Bush, so by Republicans. And since 1991, America failed to come up with new vision. So what's next? So what was the vision? I mean, what what was the vision that America was following or enacting from the end of uh, World War II to the end of the Cold it's War? The, to stop communism, mm -hmm. to, and and I, I I'm a big fan of Harry S. Truman. Mm -hmm. You know I think it's 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 he's, uh, he's been reevaluated recently right. as, as as one of the best presidents. I think that's the that's the world owns him. You know um, saving half of the planet from communism uh, and his instincts. You know just that helped him to stand against Stalin. When people say oh Putin is strong. Harry Truman stood against Stalin right. <laughs> yes. in the height of Stalin's powers. And it's, it's not about, you know, it's not about strength of the dictator. It's about lack of political will on the side of the free, free world. And, uh, um, and uh, um, it was a course, you know, that's, 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 that's convinced everybody from, from false to friends, from dictators to, 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 to the oppressed. America was there. And that's what we're missing today. America is no longer there. Okay, so let's talk about this a little bit. So what, what were the defining attributes, and uh, particularly from somebody who grew up in the Soviet Union, what were the defining attributes other than anti-communism that Americans stood for? Like why, why was America good beyond simply being anti-communist? No, it's uh, anti-communism, uh, uh, American anti-communism was viewed as the, as the antidote against, against uh, communi communist destruction. Because you know those of us who could read books, uh, listen to, to 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 the radio, and uh, and especially travel abroad, we knew that there was a better world mm -hmm. outside uh, of the of the um, or on the other side of Iron Curtain. But this world had to be protected against communism, and America was the guardian. America was the leader. And it was it's a, a world proverbial proverb for us. It was a proverbial shining city on a hill. Yeah. And that uh, uh, is that tied to the abundance that you talked about? It's this flavor sink, you know. It's it's a land of opportunity. So it's this is I first time I traveled to America was in 1988. So yes, I was already world champion. I was 25, so I already traveled, you know, just across Europe, and uh, I mean, it was still, you know, quite an imp an impression. So this is just first time landing in New York. So this, though, again, I was financially independent. I just, you know, just, it, I it, I was so different from many of the Soviet competitors. I still was impressed. But the key is, you know, this is America was a factor. And that's what we knew. That the Soviet Union, whatever they wanted, you know, to, to, to do around the world, they, they, they had to face American opposition. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, in, in, in the 90s, in just, it's, um, probably just, you know, until the uh, end of, the, uh, of Bush 43 uh, uh, presidency, people knew that America was there. And unfortunately, over the last um, 30 years, we're seeing this as the uh, American factor 
America as, as a geopolitical factor is, is simply is, is vanishing. So beyond military projection, and you know, and America obviously has been in the world in the past 20 years. I mean, we're, you know, we were in Afghanistan, we were in Iraq, we have military bases all over the place. What, you know, where did we go missing? Uh, and, and in the 90s, Bill Clinton, you know, he dispatched troops and bombs all over the place. But you're saying that there was not a direction. Not, it's not, look, it, this is not about, this is not about uh, troops only. This is not about right. military power. This is not just about economic power. It's about political will. People could sense it. And uh, America, American prestige was, was wounded in, in, in 1975 the pictures of Saigon, of the stampede from Saigon, they, you know, stuck in the minds of a lot of people, but it was quickly recovered. You know, just as Reagan came back, came to power, and, it's, and everybody knew that it was just, you know, it was not an accident, but it was, um, it was a bumpy road. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it's the, America had to abandon South Vietnam, but um, it was a local triumph. So, um, and of course, you know, this is the, the, in 1991, American stock was the highest on, uh, uh, in the world. So democracy was, was dominant, and a lot of people believe that it's, that would be the end of, of history. That's the, right. one of the most uh, popular books of the time, you know, the end of history. And, uh, and it's the end of, the history doesn't end. Evil doesn't disappear. Uh, it could uh, be buried under the rubble of Berlin Wall, but the moment we lose our vigilance and turn to be complacent, so is it, it that, out. So it's that the United States stopped being a kind of promoter and defender of uh, democracy. It's, the, it's, not about, it's more about you know the guidance, because the, the the end of the Cold War meant we had to look for new institutions, new plans. Right. In 1945, 1946, there were new 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 institutions, the United Nations, and then America, you know, helped to build these institutions like NATO. And by the way, domestically, you know, just it's it 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 had a National Security Council, CIA, Voice of America turned into ma ma propaganda machine, Marshall Plan for Europe. Right. There was a plan, uh, and it 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 was it has been carried out by Democrats and Republicans. Right. Yeah, the, you could see the differences. But, but, still, but there was a broad consensus. Could, exactly, there yeah. was a broad consensus. Yeah, yes, as when you go back to, let's say, you know, the first televised debates between Nixon and Kennedy, they, they debated about means, not about goals. Since 1991, America was, as, as, as a world leader, was fading because it had no plan. So how do we build the new world? Because United Nations was, you know, the main idea behind UN, was to prevent World War III. And, yeah, well knew. It's, it's just to stop, you know, open confrontation between the USSR and the United States, to avoid, you know, any chance of nuclear Armageddon. So in 1962, you know, during uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, it was not for UN, but it just for direct communication. So, but still, UN was there right. to, uh, to, to, to talk about it, to freeze conflicts. Mm -hmm. Since 1991, we had to look for new entity to solve problems, not to freeze them. Is the problem with that, uh, you know, because I'm thinking we're 20 years into, you know, we just ended 20 years of um, occupation of Afghanistan. There's been, in the United States since the early uh, 21st century, there's been a global war on terror that we've been prosecuting. Can you explain how that did not, that is not getting the job done that you're talking about here? Again, we should go back to the end of the, of, the, of the Cold War, collapse of the Soviet Union, and the lack of vision for the future. So what, was the, what's, what would be the future like with only one superpower? Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was a time to actually to push you know, the democratic agenda. So like you know, League of Democracies. You know, um, not to rely on institutions where dictators pay lip service to democracy. Right. UN is just, you know, it, today is a joke. Right. It's the, the, the UN week in New York is just, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, offers a catwalk for dictators. Right. Um, and, uh, um, and while, you know, we can just argue about certain actions of, yeah. of Clinton and Bush, I still think they, they viewed themselves as leaders of the free world, mm -hmm. as U.S. presidents. But again, this is, this the, there, was no, there was no centralized plan. It's, this is, Bush tried, but it's, I think it's, Psychologically, Americans were no longer, you know, uh, supportive of these ideas. I think that's this. What and it goes back to to the reason why there's a synthesis of communism and socialism, because people forgot about lessons of history. It's the Americans knew that they had to take sacrifices. America saved, you know, uh, 
uh, Europe in 1917, uh, joining the World War I, and saved the world in, in, in World War II by, by just, you know, taking on, on, on Hitler, uh, and of course, you know, just destroying Imperial Japan. Uh, but um, um, it's, you know, we reached a point where the idea of sacrifice is no longer popular. So people look for, um, you know, for benefits. So let's reduce the risk. And it's the, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's stock market rallies, you know, new technologies. You know, we, we live in a world, you know, where we, we could forget about the enemies. Because it's, who cares? America is too strong to, to, yes, but when Bill Clinton became president, America was all powerful. When he left his office, Al-Qaeda was ready to strike. Can I ask, uh, let me play devil's advocate. Uh, there's no question that socialism, both as a concept and as a set of policies, is more popular now than it was 40 years ago, 30 years ago. Can you, how, do, how would you talk to somebody like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or a democratic socialist in America who would say, you know, what I want is free health care for everybody. What I want is a minimum wage that is 15 or $20. Uh, what I want is equal opportunity for everybody. How is that a threat to, you know, how is that like socialism under the Soviet Union? Or, or what lessons from history are contemporary socialists in America forgetting when they push a progressive agenda? Uh, first of all, I'd like to quote Winston Churchill. There are many quotes, great quotes, from this greatest politician of the 20th century, if not all time. <laughs> Socialism um, is the religion of failure, uh, the creed of ignorance, and the gospel of envy. Yeah. And uh, um, let's start with semantics. And uh, I don't know whether AOC know, understands it, probably she's too young, maybe she does. But many of the followers do not. Bernie Sanders definitely does. This is not a, this is not a man who just you know embraced socialism by accident. Someone who decided to have his honeymoon in the Soviet Union, you know, just you know has strong af affection to Soviet socialism. Mm -hmm. Now they call themselves democratic socialists and pretend that they are like social democrats in Europe. But the reverse of these words actually makes a great deal of difference. It's very important which one is noun and which one is adjective. So the social democrats in Europe, in Scandinavian countries or in Germany, they are trying to do exactly what you said. They are trying to find some kind of social harmony. We can agree or disagree with their program. Some of them are just you know, more on the right. Some of them are more on the left. But, but we, again, they all act within the limits. It's about improving conditions for, for individuals within the system, fighting for sort of better deals for, for uh, well, working people, it's, and uh, uh, looking for you know, certain social and health benefits. The moment you reverse the words, I say democratic socialist, the emphasis on socialism. And uh, the suggestions that came from, from, this, from this far left in America, they are just, you know, they go way beyond simple improvements of, of uh, working conditions or healthcare benefits. It's, they're all connected. The attack on the very foundation of this country. Uh, just, you know, calling this country was built on evil. So bringing together all issues, you know, from environmental to, to, uh, to racial issues. And using them, by the way, legitimate concerns for their agenda. In Britain, these, for instance, many of these uh, green activists, they're called watermelon politicians. They're green on top, red inside. So I can smell it, and I grew up in this country, that the, their agenda goes way beyond, way beyond simple improvements of the, of the uh, conditions uh, for a working men and women, and, and you know, just it's, uh, offering equal opportunities. There are equal opportunities in this country. And uh, while American political system or American um, uh, economic system, it's, it's not perfect, but nothing is perfect. Mm -hmm. It still offers more opportunities for people um, of all, um, of all uh, races and, and gender and then coming from all different quarters than any other country in the world. And, um, and uh, these, the radical suggestions that are that being received you know, from, from this quarter, from, from the far left, they, in my view, just you know, aimed at dismantling America as the global factor. Um, and also, they, uh, 
speaking about rights and about, you know, and protecting minorities here, they turn a blind eye to the worst dictators in the world. The same people who are arguing about police brutality in America, they're willing to close their, close their eyes, you know, uh, or just turn a blind eye to, to vigor genocide or to, to narco, narco state in Venezuela or to slavery still exists in Africa. And that's, that's, that's a big problem because it also diminishes America's uh, ro leadership role in the eyes of people like me and millions of others who are just confused that America is now just is going against itself. Talk a bit about your plan in, in your book uh, from 2015, Winter is Coming, uh, Why Putin and Other Enemies of the Free World Must Be Stopped. Um, you talk about the need for uh, a league of democratic nations who will actually foreground democracy as an organizing principle for kind of international accord as opposed to what we have in the UN, where it's each country is kind of treated uh, you know, as legitimate uh, you know, we don't worry too much about what's going inside. Why is democracy so important to your worldview in terms of, and, and the way that America should ally with other countries? Democracy is important uh, even for pragmatic reasons because democracy offers us the best chance to advance uh, the cause of humanity. So for those who still, you know, arguing about uh, different systems, say, oh, look at China, look at America. I can tell them, yes, let's look at China, look at America. China gave us virus. America gave us an antidote, a vaccine. That's it. It's just, you don't have to go that far. So this is only free people can come up with advanced technologies that help humanity. That's happened all the time. So this is, when we look at the, at the performance of the um, scientists, uh, 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 inventors in the free world versus unfree world, it's, it's, it's always one-sided. And, uh, and trying to, to look at China and, just it's, and, 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 and to impose some of these Chinese uh, accomplishments on American soil would be counterproductive. And uh, again, um, uh, America was and is still unique by its ability to, 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 to generate innovations. And um, when you look at American job market, when you look at American science, you could see this as the, the, the immigration is still playing a key role because it's just so many people who come in, they, you know, they bring the, this, their vigor, they are just, you know, they, they are passion to, for success. And, and America can embrace them. America offers the best opportunity for this talent to be, um, to be uh, uh, found um, and, um, and explored. So on the one hand, if you have a Democratic Party that is kind of in, in the United States that is kind of, if not quite embracing, but is housing people like AOC and, you know, Democratic Socialists of America. On the other side, you have a right wing, you know, a conservative party. You, you've been outspoken against Donald Trump for, you know, all of your time in the public eye. Um, but you have a Republican Party that is incredibly hostile to immigration, uh, even and increasingly to free trade. Uh, you know, the, so um, what? You know, how how do you address the Republican side of that? How do if if on the left um, people seem to be um, stupid about history? They don't. They haven't learned the lessons of history. Or they don't understand the continuity of controlling the economy to controlling people. On the right, you have this rise of really stark nativism and of a kind of America alone. How, how, do, you, how do you convince those people to, that immigrants like you are not, a, uh, are not a threat to the country, but are rather its future? Well, it's again, it's, it's historical ignorance. It's just, you know, ignoring the fact that America was built by immigrants and always, you know, benefited from immigration. But it's not the only um, sin of the modern Republican Party. Uh, it's a uh, uh, party is still very much beholden to Donald Trump, and uh, um, and it's just they they try to turn blind eye on on power abuse during Trump's year years, and and you know if we just you know try to look at both excesses, um, I want to say fringes, but it's, yeah, it's the it both let's call them diplomatic wings of American politics. So one could get desperate because you don't know where to go. 
This country now is forced to choose at every election for lesser evil. And this country you now that, you know, that was built on striving for excellence. And all of a sudden, you know, so, oh, this is bad, but this is worse. So the last two elections, Clinton-Trump, Biden-Trump, was just about who's worse. And uh, that's a really bad sign. And uh, that's how democracy, democracy dies, when you, it's been attacked simultaneously from both sides. You know, people say, oh, Hitler won elections in Germany. He never won elections. His best result was around 38% in 1932. But the communists made nearly 16, which means, you know, that's the, this, this, the majority of Germans voted against democracy. Right now, I see that, you know, here in America, it's, it's, it becomes, you know, it's very, it, it's not even partisanship, it's tribalism. I belong to this tribe, and whatever happens on the other side, it's bad. And it's every time that we have a crisis here, you hear people pointing fingers. You know, this is, it's the, it, and it's so, it, I wouldn't call it double standards. It's, 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 it's purest form of hypocrisy. When Democrats and a Biden administration who owns this crisis in Afghanistan points at Trump that Trump signed it. It's a hypocrisy because you were in charge. But when the Republicans say, oh, Biden blew it up, ignoring the fact that Trump signed the deal with Taliban. And we can look at, you know, at, at every complaint now. Trump is in the office and you see outcries on, on, on the left. Oh, executive orders, terrible. How can you do that? Biden comes to the office and the same people demand, now you have to sign everything, undo Trump's, uh, Trump's executive orders. That's, that's not the way to move forward. How do, you, how do you get back to a world of good faith argumentation? Because that's one of the things that I'm thinking of. Uh, Sartre used to talk a lot about good faith and bad faith arguments. And we, we seem to be in a, a world now where almost everybody's making bad faith arguments. What are, you know, how, how do you shift that so that we stop having I, these kinds of awful I, I, arguments? Uh, I think that that's, that's brings us back to what America is and what America want to be. It's about America's role in the world. And that's why, you know, both, both extremes are wrong because they try to pretend that America should, should for different reasons, should be removed from, from the, from the uh, world stage. Obama was very apologetic and, 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 and Trump, who just, you know, just America first. Mm-hmm. America cannot separate itself from the rest of the world because it's, it's a world that doesn't tolerate vacuum. You walk away, somebody else gets in. The whole idea, oh, we just, you know, we can walk away, we can just, you know, be friends, we can shake hands, you know, kiss, hug, kissing, hugging, wrong, it failed. And, uh, and now it's, it's uh, the, time, the time to come up with a vision for the future is, is long overdue. I think for a lot of libertarians who are Reason's primary audience, the idea of an American presence in the world is a good one as long as it's not completely yoked or largely yoked to military presence, including intervention and whatnot. Can you talk a little bit? Are you yeah, it's talking about, you know, and, and George W. Bush certainly did a lot to drive down American attitude, you know, attitudes, positive attitudes towards America by his foreign policy. Uh, Bill Clinton did it himself. What, it, how, how do you separate this out? Or is it inherently the world that you're talking about, America as a hegemon, it's got to be militarily in place all over the it's, place? Or is it, what, what are the connections there? Look, uh, it's not just about military force or economic power or your technological uh, advancement. It's about political will and about plan. It's about the vision. It's what I call American factor. Uh, Ronald Reagan used the force once, only just it's this small operation. Right. Yes, but everyone knew he was there. Right. Nobody wanted to mess with him. It's not about using force. It's about telling people that I could use force. Uh, and um, when Stalin wanted to take over what was Berlin, and Harry Truman said, you know, we shall stay period, Stalin didn't want to, to uh, test Truman's ability to act. He knew he could. So this is two nuclear bombs dropped on Japan, you know, and many other things that Truman did proved to Stalin that, you know, You'd better play it safe. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, um, I think that we need just, you know, we need to recover this reputation. That's the, uh, the US president is the leader of the free world. 
And it's not that America is trying to make deals. Because, again, you, you, run, you, you rush from one extreme to another. You have Trump, who abandons all allies, and then Biden, who wants to please Germany and accepts Nord Stream 2, which is a t- horrible decision that emboldens Putin to, to continue his aggressive policies. So where is, the, where, is this, where is the vision? Where is this stability that could you know, offer friends of democracy worldwide you know, some confidence and to make enemies, our followers, like Chinese communists or Putin, you know, thinking about the consequences. Um, Military force is a last resort. It's still, I I think in in Afghanistan, it was inevitable. Iraq, we could question it. So, but Afghanistan was inevitable because America was attacked. Mm -hmm. And for those who say the, the mission failed, I strongly disagree because all I know that 20 years ago, Terrorists who were, who, were, who were trained there, just, you know, just uh, the terrorist attack that had been initiated from Afghan soil killed more Americans in one day than Japanese fleet at Pearl Harbor. And for 20 years, America was not attacked. So when you say, oh, we spent so much money there, um, yes, but again, America was not attacked. And whatever we say about President uh, George W. Bush, Bush 43, he became president when America was attacked. And uh, whether we measure his presidency by economic failure in 2007, 2008, financial crisis, uh, or other things, let's remember, America under him was not attacked anymore. So it's, look, it's, it's about the world where we can no longer be safe because we are separated from the rest by two oceans. And, uh, and uh, technology, it's a double-edged weapon. It helped us to advance the cause of freedom. It also helped terrorists to build their new networks. And, uh, and ironically, the, the world is getting smaller, thanks to technology invented in the free world, but also it forces terrorists and dictators to confront America because they have no other choice but to show their, their, um, their opposition, their, uh, the, like, their jihad against, against the free world, because otherwise they have to explain why the living standards are so different. In your work with the Human Rights Foundation, do you find that it, I mean, in the problem with democracy now, it's not so, it's not so much that individual countries are proxies for superpowers, like, you know, whether the Soviet Union or the United States, but it's homegrown kind of tyranny, right? So is more of the work being done not to block out Chinese influence as much as it is to actually um, you know, kind of open up countries that now have autocracies, authoritarians, tyrants who are homegrown. Yes, but it's, um, it's not as simple. Yes, they're homegrown, but what is the foundation of their power? Money. Right. And where does it come from? From the free trade, from, uh, uh, when I say free trade, from them selling national resources or right. labor, cheap labor as China. And where, where is money is kept in the free world? So this, this exchange allows them to, to generate enough cash to keep you know, their population at bay, but also to fund their geopolitical adventures. Um, and also uh, this tons of money that have been generated around the world, and we don't want to waste our time on, 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 on the financial uh, devaluation of, 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 of currencies and, and, uh, and the policies that I think is, 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 that's, that might you know, backfire in the, in the future. But the fact is that so much money is available. And for instance, I always say that Vladimir Putin controls more money than any other individual in, in human history. When you look at the combined funds that he can move around, so you probably reach an amount of $1 trillion dollars. You look at Russian budget, the different funds under the control of the Russian government and oligarch fortunes that definitely you know, could, 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 could channel money and, and under his instructions. So it's an insane amount of money. And he's not shy to use them to bribe politicians um, uh, and, and um, public figures in the free world. So what Putin did, he exposed you know, the weakness of the free world because corruption is, is endemic. Not only in Russia. In Russia, corruption is not a problem. It's a system. Here is still the problem. Less in America than in Europe, but you find the influence of Russian money everywhere from the Baltic states to, to San Francisco. Same with China. China rose because, because of the uh, open trade with, with the free world, using Chinese free labor to generate enormous amount of money. So it's, and when people say, oh, this is, China could be the leader of the world. No, if America goes bust, God forbid. So China, where is China going to sell its goods? 
So when China, if China goes bust, I think America proved to be proved to be uh, uh, um, self-sustainable. Because again, the differences between America and 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 the rise of China, for instance, that America became superpower mostly using domestic resources on domestic markets. So before American expansions after World War II, America just you know was just looking inward. Uh, so dictatorships, they don't have the same domestic consumption that could sustain uh, the, the economic growth. So that's why you know, it's 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 not one way street, right. but it's the it's it's two way street. But unfortunately, you know, that's just this this it also involves dramatic corruption. What are the best ways then to use you know the the global market system as an as an engine or as a motivator for change for increasing democracy for increasing rights of people? Look, it's 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 uh, to make sure that you know the money laundering uh, that. Um, when I say money laundering is not just mafia money, we're talking about you know the, the dictators. Uh, it's uh, will will not will not uh, help them to stay in power. It's the if if meaningful sanctions being imposed on Putin's Putin's oligarchs, his regime may not survive. But um, the problem is that it's the who is going to impose the sanctions if so many people are in, in, engaged in, in in operations that somehow have the uh, have this Russian money. And we're talking about. Tens, if not hundreds, of billions of dollars spread around. And just you know, one simple example: uh, last year, the the biggest uh, charity dona- donor in the UK was Alisha Usmanov, who donated to various chari- charitable uh, 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 causes 4.2 billion pounds. One oligarch, 4.2 billion pounds. Imagine how much of this money. Landed in 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 the char- in, in the char- in the charitable uh, organizations that have political influence and this is one oligarch and imagine you know this is how much is uh, how much of m- m- how much money has been uh, invested quote unquote in the organizations in other countries and you will not be surprised why macron and merkel are just you know showing more concerns about putin uh, putin's um, favors than about about uh, democracy in ukraine safety with ukraine or in relations with the, uh, with the united states are you, you know, your life has been spent in, a, in an era of incredible change, right? Um, you know, the past 60 years, essentially. Um, are you optimistic about the future or pessimistic? And can you separate that out from your Russian identity? I'm an incorrigible optimist by nature. So that's why for me to, to be pessimistic about the future would be quite a, quite a contradiction to my instincts. But I try to be... A realist. So um, um, I thought that Putin regime, for instance, would not survive for too long because I thought it's you know the, the free world would take decisive steps to to uh, cut it short from financial support and uh, and definitely would you know find ways to to uh, split Putin from great chunk of Russian ruling elite by using financial and political instruments. I was wrong. Um, uh, the opposition in Russia, if we speak about my country, has been decimated. People who marched with me on our peaceful rallies, were, by the way, just you know, just to remind to remind Americans, we never had a single broken window. The only violence on the streets of Russia during this period of demonstrations from 2005 to 2012, only violence came from the right police and intelligent officers. Um, all these people are either in exile like me, in jail like Alexei Navalny, or killed like Boris Nemtsov. Uh, so it offers very little um, reason for optimism. Um, I would not expect that I could come back to Russia anytime soon. I had many, many reasons to, 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 to dream about it. One of them is I would like to visit the grave of my mother who died uh, on Christmas Day uh, last year, uh, but but mm, while I remain optimistic because I believe that humanity is always moving uh, forward and upward, uh, though it's it's not simple; it's a bumpy road, and um, I think we had reasons to 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 celebrate the human genius for finding the vaccine so quickly and also for exploring the space. It's probably 
very symbolic, that big successes in space exploration, both from NASA and from uh, Elon Musk, happened at the time of this giant global crisis, caused again by the virus coming from communist China. Um, uh, uh, it still would take time for us to, um, to, um, uh, to find our path. It's just, that's, that's a problem. I think we will find it, but um, looking at America as a global leader, and I say it without full confidence, but simply because it's, 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 it's a default title. So there's no one else to lead the world. Um, I'm not yet seeing political will of in, in, America, in American political system. I don't see, of course, any any politicians, any any public figure that could, you know, lead the nation. Um, and um, and also the country is so badly divided. So uh, it's just we can recall uh, Abraham Lincoln. So the house divided uh, will not stand. So it's the um, I um, I'm, I think we 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 cannot lose hope. I uh, uh, I think that's something that that's that's again we learn from history because while we are pessimistic today, look at look at America, look at Europe. I always think, okay, what about 1940? What people thought in 1940? Not even 1941. So this is this how the look the world looked in 1940, 1941. So. We had many more moments in history where we could be really desperate. So I think now we still have many components for the free world to, su to, 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 to succeed. And now when we are talking about the collapse of the Soviet Union, again, we know the old dictatorial regimes, they fail because they cannot carry uh, the same continuous policies that could satisfy their people. And that's the difference between democracy and unfree world, because democracy can offer the sustainable growth. We can have many debates, but I think what is important is to make sure that the self-criticism in America is not turned into self-regulation. So America, you know, still, you know, remembers its role in the world. And for those who are on the right or the left or libertarians, I have this, this simple message. It's, you know, America has to, to recover herself. So just to, recognize its unique role in human history. Debates can continue about certain moments in history or about certain tactical things, but we have, you have to start with a strategy. Strategy is something that has been missing. And strategy means that you know, you, know, you, you, you have your goals and you know uh, what you have to uh, reach them. Can I also just ask very quickly, when you say China is responsible for the, the virus, are you saying it started there and then spread out or, uh, you know, just you as a matter me. of infection? Or, me. I mean, do you think that it was engineered by the Chinese government or how, when you talk about China as the source of, of COVID-19? Okay. Look, I don't pretend to have any previous information to the spread of the virus, but uh, I did my own research, collected data from open sources and uh, what I know, and again, it's just it's uh, it's not um, uh, a secret that um, the program run in Wuhan Institute was international. Uh, the lab was built by French. It had American money, American taxpayers' money, also supporting it, because during the Obama years there was a ban on this very dangerous research. Um, most of the work that was that was conducted there also was originated in America by. Uh, by Professor Barrick from, uh, from uh, North Carolina. Um, uh, um, and this Batwoman, this infamous Batwoman, she was one of his students. So they, 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 they I don't know why this research had been conducted over years, probably nearly you know, almost two decades, having the spike and just creating these viruses. Um, but clearly, you know, it's, it was in the lab and uh, it was quite amazing that so many scientists now signed this, this is the, um, uh, these early, early uh, uh, papers uh, denouncing it and talking about wet market and some other crazy ideas that, that never materialized. We understand why WHO didn't want to, um, to blame China because, again, okay, here's same corruption. It's amazing that on January 23rd, WHO on 2020, 
WHO had a press, press conference at the, at the um, World um, Economic Forum in Davos. They talked about anything but called it. The day China closed Wuhan. Now, I don't know whether there was a, a malign intention behind Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, plans to develop the virus. It remains to be found. So I would not be surprised, by the way, because as I said, Steve, uh, there were some rumors uh, among uh, uh, Chinese and, 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 and the dissidents that you know, that's, it could be developed there just to subdue Hong Kong and Taiwan. I don't know. I don't buy it. I don't know. But it came out of the lab. And China was sitting on this news, and it's most likely, as we saw now more and more evidence, it happened much earlier than December. So September, October, it came out of China. They tried to, to suppress the news. They definitely used their leverage with WHO. Uh, and um, again, that's, the, that's, that's, that's why it came from China. So we, we don't even have to, 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 to go deep down to find out whether there was any malign intention. Basically, that's they're guilty for withholding data, and, 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 and not closing Wuhan, not, you know, um, separating the, the infected areas from the rest of the world. So, and again, where was the vaccine from China? Yes, they did vaccine, but um, let's say that was not the most effective one. Gary Kasparov, thank you for talking to Reason. Thank you for inviting me.